Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Canaccord Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Chris Ozenbach, and this is my partner, Dylan Miller. And today we're going to be going over the 2024 MLB catcher and designated hitter rankings, as well as some recent happenings in the league just as far as signings, contract extensions, and uh, injury reports, stuff like that. And so we will get right into it, because we have a lot to cover today, with our catcher rankings. Yeah, let's crack open this can of corn. And before we start, we're going to address the elephant in the room. If you are a can of corn regular, you may notice that we had an off week. That's because our college athlete had a uh, a spring training. So while yep. we were trying to talk ball, he was actually playing ball. So Thank you. Thank you. It went very well, if anyone was curious. I still have an ERA of zero. All right, let's get into uh, these rankings. Chris, are you going to take us off with our consensus number one guy? Yeah, so I mean, there's not a lot that you necessarily have to say about Adley Rutschman that baseball fans don't earn, you know. The guy just rakes. The guy is a defensive, a plus defender, I guess you would say. Dylan, I don't know if you have the numbers up in front of you right now, but I know that they were absolutely ridiculous for a rookie. Which uh, yes. was 277. 20 home runs, 80 RBIs, 277 being his batting average. Yeah, so he was a rookie in 2022, so this was his sophomore season, 2023. Oh, uh, was it? I thought the yeah. first one didn't count. No, he was, was like, a, not long enough. No, he played 113 games in 2022 uh, and finished yeah, second in Rookie of the Year. Um, but this past year, 2023, as you noted, hit 277. Uh, 374 on base and slugged at a 435 clip. Uh, was an all-star, won the silver slugger, and actually came in ninth in the MVP voting in the American League. Um, the ceiling is just so high on this guy. He's a he's a established leader already going into his third season, and he I, I really don't see any argument against him for being the number one catcher. Nor do I. And to note, because we always talk about the batting average to OBP differential, he is 100 points between his OBP and batting average, which is something you don't really see out of a younger player. That kind of play discipline, that kind of seed the ball. So he is he is well on his way to being the number one catcher for a couple years to come, I would imagine. Yeah. All right, let's get into uh, number two. We have two. Will Smith of the Los Angeles Dodgers. Yeah, first. Uh, bit different than Rutschman. Rutschman's kind of a great all-around player, whereas Smith is still a good defender behind the dish. He more so relies on his bat uh, in that prominent Dodgers lineup. Uh, last season hit 261 with a ridiculous 359 on base and slugged at a 438 clip, which is good for just south of 800 OPS. Uh, guy was an all-star for the first time in his career, and he just he's in that Dodgers lineup, so he's not going to get as much attention as some of these other guys. But he is just as vital to that Dodgers lineup. Uh, he walks a ton, and when the opportunities are there for him to drive in those runs, he does that. Uh, he drove in 76 last year, which as a catcher is nothing to sneeze at. Uh, just I like what I see with this guy. He passes the eye test. Yeah, and he has very similar numbers to Rutschman as far as the bat goes. Um, he's 10 points below him in batting average, uh, 10 points below him in OBP, um, which just goes to highlight, like Will Smith being an offensive catcher, goes to highlight how good Adley Rutschman's season was last year. Like, his numbers are better than an offensive catcher. And for whatever reason, catchers are not offensively prone generally speaking the catcher is never going to be the best hitter on the team at a professional level and a lot of that is to do that the fact that defensive catch like being good at defense is a priority for a catcher because they are always involved with the play somehow whether it's throwing a runner out whether it's blocking baseballs that tends to come first that's why it's not like a you know we hear us talking like oh Adley Rutschman's numbers are incredible and then we talk about like if you compare him to Mookie Betts it's not going to be much of an offensive comparison but yeah Absolutely. Moving right along to Sean Murphy, who he's still on the Braves, right? They didn't trade him? Yes, he is still a Brave, unfortunately. Yeah, no kidding. Um, He's just been Mr. Consistent, I think, really, since he's been in the league. 
he hasn't really had a a bad set. Actually, no, that's a lie. He had a 2020-2021 slump in Oakland that was not great. But 2022 to this year where he was an all-star in Atlanta, he hit uh, 251 with an on-base percentage of 365, which is great plate discipline. Slugging 478 with 21, 21 home runs. So a lot of power for a catcher. Good on-base percentage. Batting average sits about where you'd want a major league catcher to sit. That 250 to 260 area is pretty typical for your blue chip catchers as far as offense goes. So, Yeah, and I think defensively he is arguably one of the top three guys behind the plate. Uh, just has an absolute cannon of an arm, is an excellent blocker, uh, just makes people afraid to run on him. It's kind of hard to put a price tag on that because you don't have guys trying to take extra bases knowing that there's a very real possibility that they'll get hosed. Yeah, and at the end of the day, no matter how good a catcher is, he is going to have he's going to make bad throws. So the fear factor of not making a runner go means that he's at less of a risk to make those bad throws down to second base. So maybe he would have the guy dead in the water, but he throws it five feet to the left and then he's safe. When the runner's too scared to steal because they know you're that good, then that stuff's not going to happen in the games as much. Yeah, certainly. All right, let's uh, go into number four. Uh, we got JT Real Muto of our Philadelphia Phillies. Uh, relative down year from JT's norm. Uh, he hit 252 with a 310 on base and slugged 452. Uh, slugging and on base were right around his career average, but he was about 20 points lower in his batting average department compared to his career average. Uh, still drove in 63 with 20 home runs, uh, had 16 stolen bases, so a little bit less uh, steals than his 2020 season he had in 2022. But the guy still is an absolute general behind the dish. Um, and I don't think his fall in this list compared to previous years more so is on him seeing a little bit of regression at the plate. I think it more so speaks to how good these up-and-coming young frontline catchers are. Yeah, and I mean, look, JT's been in the league since 2014. That is an extremely long career for a catcher. It is not a position that you normally play for a really long amount of time. It takes a massive toll on your body. So I think I don't want to down talk my guy here as a Philly fan, but I don't really think we're going to see him like all of a sudden go back to being a 375 hitter with a 340 OVP. I think that where he's at right now is probably about what his ceiling is going to be next, like this coming season. Yeah. And, you know, honestly, if he gives us a season like he did last year, I think with his defense that is still good enough to keep him kind of in this top five consideration. Uh, we'll just have to see what some of these other guys on this list are going to put up. Definitely. And I'm going to briefly mention this because I don't want to stay on JT for too long, but I did a whole statistics project on how JT Real Muto should lead off the batting order because he bats like 60 percentage points better when there's nobody on base. If you watch Philly's games, if there's a runner on first and JT's up to bat, he's hitting into a ground ball double play. His rate, his ground ball double play rate is like double what everyone else is in the league. So for all of the Phillies managers that watch our podcast, stop letting that happen. (laughs) Moving along to, uh, I guess the honorable mentions and Mr. Contreras are going to come up at the exact same time. Dylan, do you want to give us a little background on Contreras? Yeah, so uh, Contreras was on the Braves up until this past 2023 season when he got traded to uh, the Brewers in the three-team trade that brought Sean Murphy to Oakland, or not to Oakland, but from Oakland to Atlanta. Uh, This past year, with 141 games, which was by far his career high, uh, he hit 17 home runs, drove in 78 with 38 doubles. Hit 289 with a 367 on base and a 475 slug, which was good for an 825 OPS, so well above league average at the plate and as well as behind the plate. Uh, this guy, I'm sure a lot of people 
that have been following baseball for a while know of his brother Wilson and how good of a catcher he was with the Cubs and still is a pretty decent catcher with the Cardinals. But William kind of got overshadowed by having his big brother kind of take the league by storm and no one really saw him come through. And he was definitely uh, a shining spot in that Brewers lineup this year. Yeah, absolutely. And I would make the argument that he is the best offensive catcher in the league as far as consistent production. Not quite the pop that the other guys have, but batting average and OBP-wise, he clears by quite a bit. Yeah. And speaking of pop at the catcher position, that'll bring us right into our next guy, our first (laughs) honorable mention, Cal Raleigh, also known as Big Dumper of the Seattle Mariners. Yep. So Cal Raleigh is going to be the second of three switch hitting catchers that we talk about today. And he just has immense pop from both sides. Uh, Love the position by far with 30 home runs last season. uh, Drove in 75. He's going to hit for a low average. uh, Hit 232 last year, but still walked uh, a good enough amount to raise his on-base percentage above 300 and slugged at a 456 clip. Uh, And Raleigh's just another guy that is amazing behind the dish and one thing that's kind of hard to quantify with stats is how he steps up when the game's on the line um i don't know how many people remember in 2022 when he hit the the walk off to send the mariners to their first playoff appearance in 21 years and i think that's something that mariners fans will never forget Uh, it's just gonna hopefully keep him in seattle for a long time i think he's a good fit yeah, I absolutely agree, and I like what you said about the clutch factor, because that is an underrated, I don't want to say underrated, but unquantifiable statistic. Guys like him and like like Bryce Harper. Bryce Harper is an amazing baseball player, but re- what really sets him above everyone else is the moment. Like, when he gets into the moment, he is unbeatable, and Raleigh definitely has that clutch factor about him. Moving... Right along to Jonah Heim. I am assuming I don't know a whole lot about Jonah Heim, to be fair. He was an all star last year, 258, 317, 438 slashing. I'm assuming he's a demon defensively. Uh, yeah, he is. He is really good defensively. Yeah. And he, uh, not quite to the degree of Raleigh, but he does tend to have his clutch moments as well. And uh, he is going to be the third switcher that we talk about, the final one. Uh, He's a little bit better on the bright side against left-handers, but can still definitely hold his own against right-handers batting from the left side. Uh, He hit 258 last year, which actually is a good bit higher than his career average. Uh, 317 on base and a 438 slug. Uh, 755 OPS, which is a little bit better than league average at the position but that switch hitting ability and his defense kind of helps raise him into this honorable mention as well as he's in a loaded rangers lineup so those numbers if he falls a little bit shorter next season it's not going to be all on him to carry those rangers he's kind of just a good supplementary piece to what they already have yeah, and it'll definitely inflate things like his RBI numbers. I don't know how many guys I know that are hitting 258 and have 95 RBIs. That is pretty crazy. All righty. Francisco Alvarez, Dylan, take her away. Yeah, so Francisco Alvarez is our lone rookie that we're going to talk about for catchers. Um, last season in 123 games, he had 25 home runs, which is – actually crazy i think if he played a full season he might have surpassed cal raleigh for the lead in home runs at the catcher position uh only hit 209 with a 284 on base but slugged at a 437 clip so i think with uh having a full year under his belt he's gonna chase less and we're gonna see that batting average and on base tick up and in turn he's gonna force pitchers to give him a little bit more to hit which will raise that slugging percentage as well. Yeah, I agree. I don't really have much to add on him, but he is a young guy. Like you said, he's 
really his first year was last year. He played five games in 2022. But, uh, yeah, I can't imagine he's going to get any worse, and that pop off the bat is insane. So Yeah, one quick note with Alvarez, um, something that also kind of can't be quantified. I think he's very mature for his age. Uh, obviously, this was the first year that the pitch clock was implemented in the major leagues. And I remember one clip, I forget who was pitching for the Mets, but um, it was a critical situation in the game, and they're about to get a pitch clock violation, which in turn would have walked the batter. And he actually called time with like less than two seconds left and ran out to the mound to make sure that they didn't get that penalty to walk that batter. So I thought that was just a cool note to yeah. see from a young catcher. Absolutely. It's a, a just another thing that they have to do, as if the position wasn't mentally taxing enough. Now they have to worry about keeping the pitcher on the clock. But I think that wraps up our catcher discussion, unless there's anything else you'd like to discuss. Oh, I think uh, we're good to go into our next topic, which is DHs. Not, why do I have, I have an arrow pointing to center field, which I thought <laughs> I removed, but apparently I did not. Yeah, but, a lot of these guys will not ever slip time on center field. Yeah, that's kind of the idea is that they don't want them to play the field. <laughs> but <laughs> our first guy, uh, I mean, it's it's pretty obvious, uh, Shohei Otani, mostly because of I I think his dual threat ability once he's healthy, but also just because the dude rakes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, only 135 games last year. He uh, got injured in that last month of the season. Uh, still led the league or led the American League with 44 home runs, drove in 95, swiped 20 bags. Uh, hit 304 with a 412 on base and a 564 slug, good for a 1.066 OPS, which is bonkers. Yep, that is absolutely insane. But for half a billion dollars, you better be hitting like that come uh, come the regular season because that contract, man, that's crazy. Yeah, well, he's only getting two mil this year. All right, sorry, I forgot. <laughs> ah, sell the team at the end. Yeah. Moving so along. So with that, we will <laughs> go to somebody who is probably very happy that he's out of the American League, let alone the American League West, in Jordan Alvarez, who uh, he finished uh, third place in MVP voting in 2022. So with Otani out of the league this year, he has a chance to to put together an MVP season uh, in 114 games. So he was also injured a good bit of the season. Uh, He still hit 31 home runs and drove in 97 uh, with a a 293 batting average, a 407 on base, and a 583 slug, which gave him a 990 OPS, just shy of that 1,000 mark. Uh, Alvarez... We spoke about clutch factor earlier. He's got it. Yeah. The, and he really put that on display in the 2022 playoffs, uh, hitting the walk off against the Mariners. Yeah. Uh, was rooting for the Mariners, by the way. Hitting that huge home run against Jose Alvarado in the World Series to put them ahead. It's just this guy is one of the scariest batters that you can have to face as a pitcher. Yeah, he is. He is another one of those clutch guys, and he just, man, I don't want to talk about the 2022 playoff season right now, <laughs> especially not that home run. Number three, our our own, very own Kyle Schwarber, who is either my favorite player on the team or my least favorite player on the team, and there's never any in between. Yeah. Uh, so Kyle Schwarber played 160 games last year, so only missed two. Uh, hit 47 home runs and drove in 104. Uh, by far, career worst, 197 batting average. But got on base at a second career high at 343 and slugged 487, which is still good for an 817 OPS. Um, led all of the major leagues in strikeouts, though, with 215, but also was in the upper upper echelon in the walk department with 126. Yeah, it's interesting seeing a guy with both tremendous plate discipline, but also just occasionally has the inability to hit the ball. 
Yeah, he he is the definition of a three true outcome hitter. Those three true outcomes being strikeout, walk, or home run. Yeah, it's, he is very Ryan Howard esque. But he's a uh, he's obviously another scary guy to face in the box. Uh, we've seen what he does both in the month of June and in the playoffs. Um, I believe he is second all-time in NLCS home runs, uh, which is absolutely crazy. Uh, he's the uh, he's the only player to hit a home run in, like, every single game to, that you can possibly play in baseball, right? Yeah, every every single uh, playoff series, I believe it is. Because yeah. he hit one in the college playoff series, uh, hit one in the World Baseball Classic, uh, the wild card round, divisional round, championship round, and World then series. the... Uh, CS or the World Series. Yeah. All right. On to our honorable mentions because, to be honest, the designated hitter position is not the most like Stacked. deep position. <laughs> yeah. Like there's a reason these guys don't play the fields. And so we'll start with Mitch Garver. If you would like to take us away with him. Yeah. So Mitch Garver uh, started out as a twin and was a catcher for the Twins and kind of saw a slump. So the Rangers took a flyer on him last year and in 2022 and proved to actually be a big part in their World Series run as well as the whole regular season. Uh, He hit 19 home runs and only drove in 50, but he only played in 87 games. He wasn't playing every day, so he was more of a platoon guy. Uh, He hit 270 with a 370 on base and a 500 slug, which is good for an 870 OPS which is right around what we said Schwarber's was, just that he doesn't have, I don't know, I don't feel comfortable running Mitch Garver out every day over a guy like Schwarber, which is why we dropped him into the honorable mention territory. But, yeah, yeah, this guy, if you need him behind the plate, he's more than capable, but he's going to mostly DH for the, the Mariners this season. Yeah, and Kyle Schwarber does lack consistency, but he consistently hits home runs, if that makes sense. Yeah. He's not consistently on pace, but it's like, if you watch Kyle Schwarber for five games, he's probably going to hit a home run in one of them. All right, let's go on to our next guy, uh, Josh Naylor. Kind of tricky to figure out where to place him, because he does play a lot of first base, but some of the fan graphs projections that I had seen had him starting at DH more so than first base. So we ranked him as a DH. Um, in which case he definitely is in that honorable mention territory. Uh, in 121 games last year, he hit 20 or 31 doubles, uh, 17 home runs with 97 driven in, uh, hit a career high 308 with a 354 on base and just shy of a 500 slug with a 489. Uh, Josh Naylor, he's kind of slept on being that he's on an unexciting Cleveland Guardians team. But if you have the chance to tune into a game, definitely keep your eye on this guy. He is very sneakily underrated and underappreciated. And I think a lot of his underratedness comes from the fact that that 308 batting average is 30 points better than anything he's ever done. And it is 50 points better than 2022, 2021, and 2020. So that was kind of, I don't want to say unprecedented, but out of the blue. Yeah, he definitely unlocked something that he hadn't had in his arsenal. And he did it over the full season, which more so makes me believe that it wasn't a fluke. You know, sometimes guys have really hot months that kind of inflate their numbers, and that just wasn't the case with Naylor. He was like this all season long. Yeah, a number you can look at that actually might justify what you just said is that his home run numbers, despite getting a lot less hits, went down. Or went up. I'm sorry. He hit 20 home runs in 2022 with a bad batting average, and he hit 17 in 23 with a really good batting average. So what I'm thinking is he might have taken some of that pop away from the plate, focused on putting bat to ball, and it's really, really translate. I mean, 60 points almost in batting average is insane. Yeah, absolutely. Finding a lot more gaps, too, uh, with a lot more doubles this past year. So we'll see if he can keep it up. Yippers. And then 
Oh, gosh. My least favorite <laughs> contract in MLB history. Giancarlo Stanton. Uh, former Miami Marlin. Current New York, current New York Yankee. Uh, resident of New York General Hospital. Because the guy cannot stay healthy, which is insane for a designated hitter. I don't I don't really know what keeps going wrong with him. I don't pay that much attention to the Yankees or Stanton, to be honest with you. But I know he's always hurt, and I know that he can either hit a bomb or not do that. Yeah, it's been crazy to watch this guy's, I don't want to call it a fall from grace, because when he's healthy, he does still absolutely tear the cover off the ball. But as you mentioned, he does have a lot of health concerns, only played 101 games last year. But in those 101 games, 24 home runs, 60 driven in, uh, hit 191, which is by far a career low, uh, 275 on base, and a 420 slug. So he's kind of got that Kyle Schwarber three true outcome appeal to him, but just he's swinging at way too much. He doesn't have the the plate discipline to kind of make that low batting average work. Yeah, and... For those of you, if you're new to baseball, we say fall from grace because there was a point in time where Stanton was the most dangerous hitter oh, yeah. in, in baseball, and it wasn't even, like, close. If you threw him a strike, good luck. Yeah, 2017, his last year with the Marlins when he won National League MVP, 59 home runs, 132 driven in, a 281 average, 367 on base, and a 631 slug. Yeah, the dude did everything. He was hitting, he was walking, he was hitting home runs. Like it, it was just, it was crazy. I've never, like, that was just the most dominant performance, one of the most dominant performances I've ever seen by a player. We should touch, too, on the fact he lost a bunch of weight, didn't he? Isn't he, like, super skinny now? I, I wouldn't say super skinny. He did lose weight, but he's still, you know, he is still shredded. Yeah, I don't, I, yeah, I don't mean super. I just mean he lost, for a while he was getting a little larger, and then I feel like he... They showed up to spring training, and I was like, oh, man, he looks like, I don't want to say small, but compared to what he looked like last year, small. Yeah. And then we're going to jump down into some recent spring training happenings with Wheeler's contract extension as the first one on the list. Three years, $126 million. He wanted a shorter contract, and we're going to talk about why in a little bit. But first, Dylan, I want to know, do you think this is a fair amount of money for Wheeler and for the organization, do you think one party is better off than the other? Uh, no, I I think this is a great deal for both both sides. Um, he is going to be the highest paid starting pitcher uh, of all time in terms of an average annual value. He's going to be making forty two million dollars in the twenty twenty five, twenty six, and twenty twenty seven seasons, and it, I think it's rightfully so. Uh, I listen to a lot of other baseball podcasts, and you know, consensusly, he is arguably the number two starting pitcher outside of a healthy Garrett Cole. Uh, he has the lowest whip of all time in the postseason. And he's just he's an unreal pitcher, and I am so happy that we were able to make something work that we could keep him here, you know, in the years to come. Yeah, I agree. And knock on wood, the guy has been very healthy for the Phillies. And he's been good for the organization. And the him and Nola one-two punch, as long as Nola sort of gets together this year. But I think what you said the most, I mean, this is a team that wants to make a World Series run. And this is undisputed the best postseason pitcher in the league right now. I don't even think it's close. No, I, I don't either. And I really like the... Uh, I know people will say $42 million for a pitcher is crazy. But... As an organization, the Phillies kind of have taken on more long-term contracts to kind of even out that AAV and make room for other players. And I think if they would have done that with Wheeler, they kind of would have set themselves up for disaster in years to come. But front-loading this this deal, I think, helps them out a lot and gives them more flexibility after his contract's over. Yeah, and I do want to touch on if you're looking at this and you're thinking if this guy is such a good pitcher why would they only sign him to three years wheeler is not by any means a young guy he is now a veteran seasoned and i think he requested the shorter contract he wanted the shorter one and i think a lot of guys don't want to they want to go out on top they want to go out with at least 
what they feel could be their best stuff. They don't want to have that steady fall from grace that people talk about for years to come where it's like, oh, remember how good he was? And then he stunk the last six years of his time in the majors. And so I think that's a very respectable choice by him. Yeah, absolutely. All right, moving on to our favorite league stoner, Cody Bellinger, sticking to the Cubs for three years, $80 million. I, I know I'm not totally well-versed on major league contracts, but I felt like this might have been a little high. Uh, I think given that this was his best season in four seasons, give or take, I think it was also a bit high, but I know he was also seeking more of a six-year, $150 million deal. So I just feel like the Cubs felt a little bit more comfortable giving him that short-term, a little higher AAV value. Yeah. So that, you know, realistically, worst-case scenario, he goes back to hitting 225 with minimal power. He's still going to be an elite glove for you anywhere you put him in the field. Yeah, that is true. I just, I don't know, because I, I feel like it was like he had so many, what was it, three or four years in a row, we just could not do anything, and then all of a sudden he came back out. It's just a, I don't know, $80 million seems like a lot. A big a big trust number based off of, of one year of production in the last five or six. Yeah, I think it's also kind of, as we spoke about with Josh Naylor, it was more so of a consistency throughout the entire season. I mean, I think Belly had a slow April, but as soon as he got into the swing of things, I Wrigley... He just took off and put up the not quite as good of his uh, late 2010s with the Dodgers, but you know yeah. definitely a resurgence here that hopefully sticks because when Belly's on, it's great for baseball. He's an absolute fan favorite to watch. Yeah, and by the way, when I said that 80 million dollars is high after the Bellinger Stoner take, I did not uh, do that. <laughs> I did not do that intentionally, but I'm sitting here thinking about it, and I'm really proud of that now. That was but, a great unintentional pun. Thank you. Thank you. Earl this Chapman uh, to nope. the Giants. Or not oh. Earl this Chapman. I messed that up last time, and I was really embarrassed about it. And guess what I didn't do? Change it on the slideshow. So uh, ignore that completely and pretend yeah. that it's not there. Yeah, Matt Chapman and Earl Chapman. Chapman, two completely different profiles. I did not check. So what I did when I made this for the people listening is I I went through and Dylan makes notes in our in our show thing. And I just saw Chapman and I saw the Giants. And in my head, I'm like, surely it's not Matt Chapman. It must be your oldest Chapman. Yeah, yeah. Matt Chapman. Uh, so he got three year, fifty four million dollar contract with the Giants, uh, much like Bellinger was seeking more of a six year deal. But uh I guess teams weren't really biting on that. Uh, unlike Bellinger, uh, his numbers were inflated by a very, very hot first two months of the season and then sort of fell off. But this guy is still a premium defender at third base. He can go pick it with the best of anyone. And hopefully the warmer weather kind of uh, keeps his bat hot throughout the whole year. I mean, he was always really consistent with Oakland and then when he made the jump to Toronto, uh, kind of slowed down. So it would be really nice to see him be good again. Yeah, I would love a Matt Chapman resurgence. I'd also love for everyone to ignore the fact that I put Earl to Chapman up there and just accept the fact <laughs> that it happened and it's over. Back to the slideshow. Now for everybody's fa- least favorite uh, part of updates is injury updates. Especially if you're uh, so- a Yankees fan. Yeah, some of them, some of them major, some of them not so major. Uh, Garrett Cole, with his elbow, doesn't seem to be a major concern, but the Yankees haven't really given much information regarding his injury, so that's a little concerning. But I can't imagine it's going to be something that keeps him out, you know, longer than the first few months or first few weeks of April. Yeah, I was thinking that from the way they were talking about it, they, it didn't seem like he needed surgery unless there's been an update that I didn't see. From, from what I had saw was released. So I, I think he'll be back. And he's a pretty, he's, he's a competitive dude. So I don't think he's going to miss any more time than he has to. And that brings <laughs> us into his teammate, Aaron Judge, who uh, <laughs> is beat took up. a couple, 
took a couple days off from being beat up. Uh, this, I believe the the injury updates for both of these guys came out like a couple hours apart from each other, and I just saw Yankees Twitter just <laughs> losing their minds. But uh, Judge, so today is Tuesday the 12th. Uh, Judge is supposed to play in the game tomorrow, Wednesday the 13th, so it doesn't seem to be... Uh, you know, anything serious, just definitely something to keep an eye on with him missing a good chunk of the season last year due to injury. Yeah, that's just, uh, that just it was really funny, the phrasing on that beat up, because that is actually what the does like, if you look it up online, it says that he sat because he was quote unquote beat up. It's just yeah. really, I've never heard that, like ever. It's pretty funny. Yeah. Ah. Uh, so Acuna uh, in 2021, for those of you who don't know, tore his ACL and this past week, he had some irritation in that same knee. Uh, the Braves were being very hush hush about it, kind of for no reason. Scared, scared a good bit of people, but it doesn't seem to be anything serious. Maybe just two weeks off here in spring, and then ramp up towards the end of the training camp, get him ready for the season. But yeah, he definitely didn't re tear it. But I'm thinking maybe just some like swelling and stuff like that. I don't know what kind of use he got out of it in the off season, getting back into the actual swing of baseball could have caused some sort of inflammation or something like that so uh, but i don't think it's going to be a lingering issue unlike somebody yeah. else <laughs> yeah speaking of tear and lingering issues uh lucas giolito who recently signed a two-year deal with the red sox is going to be out the full season and into next season with the torn ucl I'm gonna have to get tommy john surgery to repair that which is a bummer to see i remember 2018 lucas giolito just absolutely being dominant and was really hoping he could put together a good season in Boston. But we'll have to wait until midway through next year to see if that comes true. Yeah, and I think Boston signed him and everyone else that they've signed with the intent of being really good next year. So I don't think this really hurts what they're trying to do this season because this season, that whole, like, they are in the worst possible position of any team in baseball to try to make the playoffs right now, as far as they might, like, they have so much talent on that team. It's just that everyone else in their division has more. Yeah. Yeah. Tough, tough. If you're a Red Sox fan. Yeah. Verlander. Yeah. So, uh, these last four injuries aren't super serious. A lot of these guys are expected to return around May, but, uh, Justin Verlander does have, some irritation in his right throwing shoulder uh like i said expected to be back around may and hopefully he can i mean if you're rooting against the astros not hopefully but yeah. i like watching justin verlander pitch so i'm hoping that he uh is able to get back into the swing of things and return to that dominant cy young form now he was pretty beat up last year too wasn't he yeah i yeah i think his age is going to start to show this year the next couple of years uh especially with the the because it was was it a shoulder last year too yeah yeah i think if that keeps reappearing it's going to be a lingering thing i think he's going to be out of the league fairly soon if the injuries persist but the other guys are young matt brash elbow probably from throwing that absolutely rancid slider that he throws yeah i think uh i think his best was recorded with 23 inches of horizontal movement which is just nuts to think you are throwing a ball and it literally moves two feet yeah from the time it leaves your hand and catch, catches it which is yeah. unreal uh, i'm really happy hope... if my slider gets like six inches of break <laughs> exactly uh but i i really hope that this doesn't hamper uh brash's stuff too much he is Absolutely amazing to watch pitch if you have an opportunity to watch the Mariners. Uh, was really high on this guy when he came up and was looking to be a starter. And I think... We watched his first game. Yeah. Yeah, him in that bullpen role is just... It's a match made in heaven. Yeah, def definitely. I've been excited to watch him since we watched him start that game, what, two two years ago? Yeah. When we were in, we, when we were in college, we, me and Dylan watched the watched Mariners game that he was starting. And man, his stuff was just gross. But uh, Sonny Gray with the hamstring for the Cardinals. Hamstring injuries are 
Uh, it's weird because they can either be bad where it's like torn. I don't think that's what happened. I think it's just either a strain or like a soreness. They're being careful with it. I don't think I've ever gone a day in my life where my hamstring isn't sore. So yeah. I, I think he'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't look at what leg it was to see if it was, you know, his plant leg. Because yeah. I think if it's his plant leg, it's going to give a lot more reason for concern. Yeah, I don't... It's weird because your plant leg isn't really stretching the hamstring as much. Your push leg is the leg that really extends and contracts. The plant just takes a lot of brute force. Yeah. So I, I, I think it's just going to leave a lot of discomfort and yeah. kind of shorten up when he yeah, throws. that is possible. If he short, if it shortens up his stride, you'll see a, a fall off pitching wise for sure. Yeah. And then. Uh, while we're on the category of legs, uh, Josh Jung is uh, experiencing some calf injuries. Uh, like I said, though, he's slated to come back in May. And really hope this guy puts together another season like last year in his rookie year. Uh, very fun to watch. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I don't think his is going to be remotely serious either. I'm pretty sure he's going to be back at it pretty soon. We should discuss some pretty crazy performances there's kind of two that i have rolling around in my head one is jackson holiday having an absolute spring training tear i don't have the numbers in front of me but i know he's going nuts he had that grand slam uh, i forget who was it against but i saw the clip of it i mean he's like he's got to be hitting like 350 or like 400 in preseason right now yeah crazy we uh we gave all the praise in the world to zach wheeler earlier uh First, first at bat he ever faced Wheeler hit a triple. Yeah, which is insane. And then also, oh, what's his name? The kid, the seventeen-year-old of the Padres. Uh, Ethan Salas. Yeah. Or Camposano. Ethan Salas. That's awesome. That's so cool to be seven. I mean, it makes me feel bad as a twenty-two-year-old college baseball player, <laughs> but it's pretty cool to see a seventeen-year-old make it to the league like man if, like as a kid that's like dream that's what you want to do to do it before most people are graduating high school is absolutely absurd yeah i uh call me a fake fan yeah just i know of some of these hot starts from you know following along uh, via socials uh, if anyone's not on twitter or now x and you are looking to follow baseball a little bit closer, that is definitely the platform to do it. Uh, people tweet out clips of just about anything going on in games, so it's really easy to stay engaged with uh, some of these big moments that we're seeing in spring, and then that will obviously transition to once the, the regular season starts. Yeah, first, it's definitely something to keep, keep a watch on. Those are the only two that I really knew, but like off the top of my head that were like, blowing me away kind of a thing i don't want to really nitpick spring training because at the end of the day it's just spring training yeah but something something to talk about but i believe that's it for today yeah speaking of socials uh if you are not on our socials get there canicorn media um i want to thank you guys for taking the time to listen uh you know really appreciate the support whether it be uh, reposting stories, just liking our content, or you know, even just tuning in. Uh, we appreciate all of our viewers and all the support. Yeah, thanks, guys. And I did want to know, I almost forgot, uh, I put up a thing, a questionnaire on our story the other day. A lot of you answered. I did not expect that many responses. So next episode, we're going to try to get to all of those. I'll try to, we'll answer as many of those questions as we can. And uh, as long as they were PG, I know some, some of you <laughs> As long as they're PG, we'll answer them. PG-13. We can get a little frisky. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you, guys. Peace.